Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. This isn't exactly how I envisioned doing my very first PABC forum presentation, but I'm still happy to be here and to share this amazing story with you. Hopefully you take one or two things out of this presentation and hopefully I don't bore you for the next 20 to 25 minutes or so. So let's get started. So my name is Brianna May. I am a physiotherapist in Victoria, BC. I work at two different clinics. One is in Parkway, one is in Langford called Parkway, and the other one is in the city called Neuromotion. Um, and is, it was at Neuromotion that I saw this patient that I'll be talking to you about today, who was diagnosed with Japanese encephalitis and dengue fever. So just a little bit of background story on that. So at Neuromotion, we are a specialized neurological um, outpatient clinic. So we see anything from stroke to spinal cord injury to brain injury, MS, anything with a more specialized neurological diagnosis. That's what we'll see at Neuromotion. This is just a picture of our space that we have here. And so my background has been a bit more in the brain injury world. I see anywhere from five to 15 concussions a day and any of that ranging from a more mild to traumatic brain injury. Um, so I was approached by my admin staff saying that I was going to be getting a new patient who was diagnosed with Japanese encephalitis. And I was like, I have no idea what that is or what I'm supposed to do with that. And she was like, oh, that's fine. You'll, you'll figure it out. My boss said that you were the best one for him. So I was like, okay, kind of scrambled trying to figure out what to do with this new client. Um, so Kelly came in and started telling her story. She was infected with dengue virus and Japanese encephalitis while traveling in Asia. She was infected on March 19, 2019, and it required hospitalization while she was over there in Asia. Finally, when she was, when she was a bit more medically stable, she was able to be transferred back to BC. Um, by April, she needed to be put into a coma for five days because it couldn't stabilize her blood pressure. And by June, finally, she was able to be released back home into Parksville or Qualica marriage is where she's from. Um, she does a little bit of a better job of explaining her story. So I just have a quick little video that uh, where she talks about that. Hi, my name is Kelly and I'm here to share my miraculous recovery from a double viral infection of dengue fever and Japanese encephalitis acquired by a uh, mosquito. I'm going to use some notes as staying focus is still a goal that I'm working on. I was hospitalized on March 10th, 2019 after leaving Cambodia to a hospital in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. I had a fever of 40 degrees Celsius, severe and burning headache, muscle weakness, which later progressed to hallucinations, ataxia, Parkinsonism, slurred speech, diplopia, cerebellitis, and convulsions. When stable enough to fly, I was medevac from Vietnam to Royal Jubilee Hospital in Victoria for a 10-day stint of IVIG therapy. I was then readmitted as my symptoms became exacerbated. My convulsions resulted in a code blue falling by intubation, a medical induced coma and a transfer to Victoria General ICU, then the neurological ward. A spinal tap confirmed Japanese encephalitis, also known as brain fever. I had inquired about a vaccine, but was told that getting JE was rare. New statistics, now say it affects one in 5,000 in Southeast Asia and India with a 35 to 40% mortality. Of those that survive, only 10% will make a full recovery. The remaining may suffer severe neurological impairment, be trached on feeding tubes, non-communicative in institutions. Almost all exhibit some form of psycho or neurological sequelae. So as you can see, there's a lot to that type of diagnosis. Um, so just a little bit more further on Japanese encephalitis and dengue fever. They're both spread through the bite of a mosquito. Most people infected with Japanese encephalitis do not have symptoms or only have mild symptoms, but a small percentage develop the inflammation of the brain, which is the encephalitis. And with that comes a sudden onset of headache, high fever, disorientation, sometimes coma, and that was the case of Kelly, along with the tremors and convulsions. That was a big component of what she was dealing with on a daily basis. And um, as you heard her ask, she, or had, as you heard her say, she, was, she asked about a, a vaccine and was told that it wasn't really necessary because a lot of people didn't get it. So she was really unfortunate in that aspect. 
As she also said, one in four cases are fatal. Um, everyone else usually ends up in long-term care or is on a feeding tube, like she also said. And then also, although some symptoms improved after that acute phase, they'll continue to have neurological, cognitive, or even psychiatric symptoms um, afterwards. A bit more on dengue. So that's something you may have heard before, um, heard of before, as opposed to the Japanese encephalitis. It is becoming a lot more of a common thing to get, and it's grown dramatically in recent decades. So about half of world's population is now at risk of getting dengue, with an estimated 100 to 400 million infections each year. And you can see my stats here. This has risen from the case, the amount of cases have risen from over 500,000 in 2000 to over 3 million in 2015. So you might be thinking as you watch this presentation, well, I'm probably never gonna see anyone with Japanese encephalitis in my career. That may be true, but you could see someone with dengue very easily as it is becoming something that's much more common. So this is just what Kelly's rash looked like that helped them diagnose that dengue. Um, just so you could get a bit more of an idea of what that looks like. So how did she present initially? Well, she had a few things going on. The biggest things were difficulty walking, speech difficulties, memory deficits, lots of difficulty with balance and coordination. She kind of had these ataxic movements that were hard to predict. Dizziness, intense fogginess. A big thing for Kelly was the sensory overload with excessive noise, bright lights, and busy environments. So anytime that she was in some of those um, busy environments or if the clinic was what had a lot going on, she didn't tolerate that well at all. Headaches, neck pain from convulsions, and again, she'd have kind of some of these uncontrolled movements where her head would just go in some of these ranges that that would be painful for anyone. Um, anxiety, not feeling like self, and just an overall sense of not feeling well. So as you can see, if you were to read that list, and if you have any kind of experience with brain injury or concussion, that kind of looks like a similar list to concussion. So when I first saw Kelly, I didn't exactly know what to do with her. She, she asked me if I had ever seen anyone with Japanese encephalitis before. And, and in normal circumstance, if, if any, most physios would probably say, if someone asked them about a condition and they haven't seen it before, they still might say, yeah, you know, I've seen that before, or I could figure it out, and just kind of give them that vote of confidence. I couldn't even do that with Kelly. In any other situation, I probably would have, but I couldn't with Kelly, and I, I was honest with her, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I haven't seen anyone with Japanese encephalitis before. And she said, well, that makes sense because I'm currently the only case in BC and there's only a couple in Canada. And so I was really happy that I didn't tell her I knew what I was doing because I really didn't. And I did tell her though that I had a lot of experience with brain injury and I was planning on treating her very similar to how I would treat anyone with a brain injury. And just more a bit, um, bit more on social history with her, she was a massage therapist and she lives in Qualicum. So just keep that in mind, kind of we're talking about treatment style she did live two hours away from the clinic, so we had to manage um, treatments once a month. That's essentially what we ended up doing moving forward. So how did she present objectively? Uh, balance was really difficult, especially eyes closed. She had uh, so much difficulty getting into different positions or that tandem position or single leg balance positions if her eyes were closed. But even just eyes open was a challenge for her as well. She had a lot of difficulty with visual stimulus so any of our saccade testing and our smooth pursuit testing was quite challenging again i treated her like a concussion so i, I screen i did a bomb screen on her in order to figure out a few of these things and like i said earlier with the the with her presentation it was difficult to tell where to go with her and so that's why i chose to do that type of screen so uh, her vestibular component was also a big challenge for her. She, anytime there was head movements, especially if it was quick head movements, she couldn't keep that gaze stability at all on the target. Um, she often felt disoriented if we did do any kind of vestibular testing and she was quick to feel nauseous or dizzy with um, any rapid head movements. So this is what she looked like on, um, in that first week that I saw her. This was her 10 meter walk backwards. So as you can see, she has quite a few uncontrolled movements that were really hard to predict. And I didn't ask her to walk in tandem. She just chose to walk like that. And she, when I asked her why she did that, she actually had no idea. Um, and I always, I always love kind of, I laugh watching this video because my coworker, Jackie, shout out to her in this video. 
I just asked her to spot Kelly while I took this, while I was on camera and didn't really give her any insight on to how much spotting she would have to do. And she kind of said to me afterwards, like, well, I could have used a bit more of a heads up on there. So I apologize to her for that. But as you can see, this is quite a strenuous walk for Kelly. She can't control that, that movement and the, it's just very uncoordinated as she tries to take some of those steps. So I think total this 10 meter walk took over a minute to do and she was quite fatigued and, and um, strained mentally afterwards as well. So this is the same day. Um, again, uh, what I tried to do with her was think back to how I would treat someone with a concussion and sometimes what we like to do is if someone is really has difficulty with stimulation or has difficulty with input coming in, we sometimes put them in a weighted compression vest to help with some of that sensory overload. Just gives them a bit more grounding ability and gives them a better sense of where they are in space. So I was like, okay, let maybe let's try this on Kelly, see what happens just to, um, just to give it a go. And this was the same day, same time, um, her moving, walking backwards with the vest on. So it was just such a big difference right away. She felt more grounded. She felt more oh stable. God, so or she didn't do that kind of crisscross criss walking yeah. that she was doing prior. Um, it just made such a difference in her in her gait. And this is her again with, with wow. the vest on. She was so excited that she could do that. She hadn't run since her initial diagnosis. So she was a, she was a happy camper that day in the clinic. So what else did we do that kind of worked for Kelly? Well, that weighted compression vest was a really nice piece that we started with. Again, just to get her kind of grounded and have a bit more awareness where she was in space. The other big pieces with her was, again, treating her similar to concussion. So a lot of that planning, pacing goals that we go over with someone who has concussion, who has, has very little uh, awareness of how much they're doing throughout the day, we went over a lot of that kind of stuff with Kelly. And if you've, the shout out, shout out to um, Parkwood who designed these kind of graphs. This is from the St. Joseph's Hospital there in Ontario. And it just kind of is a nice visualization for patients to understand, okay, so in the safe zone, I'm not having any symptoms. In the danger zone, I'm quite symptomatic. And what happens is they start to do a few things. They, they start to creep into that danger zone. They get a few more symptoms, but they still feel like they have to do just a bit more and they push it to that next level. And then what happens is they have a big crash afterwards and it ends up being kind of this big yo-yo effect where they're never actually getting full recovery or full rest because they're constantly going in and out of symptoms and then having these big crashes. So what we look for instead is more of a pattern where we're saying hi to the symptoms, we approach it and we do it with a little bit more of a plan in place and then we back off. So we do that kind of a bit more with a bit more fluidity as opposed to just blowing up symptoms and then coming back down. And eventually what happens is that ability to tolerate more increases and we go into that danger zone a little bit less. So this was pretty huge for Kelly to have a bit more of a framework. And going along with that, we also use the strategy of what we call pacing points. So again, this is from Parkwood Hospital here where they strategize out how to structure your day a little bit better instead of, it's very similar to how you do the, the point system with, on Weight Watchers. You give a point value to all your foods and then throughout the day you're trying to stick to a number of foods. Well, the same thing goes for activities. So you have each activity that you do throughout the day has a point value where some more stimulating tasks are going to be worth more points. And so if you do do those tasks, that's okay, but then you might have to accommodate somewhere else throughout the day. So for someone who's a bit more type A personality who needs that structure, it really does help to give them a bit more of a framework. And this was definitely Kelly. She, she liked to know what she needed and, and how she could plan her day a bit better. So that was a really nice tool for her in the beginning. The other things we did is we worked a lot on some visual aspects, especially her peripheral vision. She, she struggled a lot with taking in that environment. So we made that a goal in the first initial um, weeks of treatment, just to be able to take in a bit more information without being so focal. Again, similar to how we treat a concussion. And then some vestibular work. So kind of like you saw a bit of that coordination and um, sensory integration was off. So we worked a lot with getting that gaze stability back and being able to tolerate more fast head movements. And she seemed to do pretty well with that, even though it was quite symptomatic in the beginning. The other thing is incorporating that balance. A uh, big thing for her, again, we, we did some eyes closed stuff just to work on the vestibular system at the same time. 
and then we progressed progress exercises. So I had her deadlifting in the clinic eventually. We were, were doing some jogging on the treadmill. We did some rowing. We kind of did a little bit of everything. Again, she was quite active before her diagnosis. So for her, she was just so excited to be able to do any kind of activity, even though all the doctors were telling her, well, we don't know what you're gonna be able to do and just kind of always limiting her a little bit in that regard. And the other big thing with, with Kelly was light and noise reintegration. So we worked a lot. At first, we had her wearing um, earphones or, no, or noise canceling earphones to help with that and slowly progressed into being able to tolerate more stimulation and more sensory input through noise and through lights um, by integrating some of those systems together. So we would be more in a busier environment with a little bit less noise or a little bit less light, kind of playing with those. Um, as we go. So this was her one month after initial session. Again, she, when we first got to the clinic, she came in for a week. I saw her three times. We went over a bunch of stuff and then she came back a month later. So as you can see, such a big improvement in her 10 meter walk um, one month later after she integrated everything we talked about in that first week of treatment. This was her working on a vestibular exercise also a visual and an exercise component here going on. She, we were doing this while in the clinic. Um, so this is her trying to track the ball, being able to move the head freely along with be able to keep her balance in that lunge position. So sorry about my camera work here. I'm trying to spot her as she does a little bit of this, which was a bit of a challenge. And she had a lot of difficulty with any kind of turning. So again, that vestibular component of having to turn really quickly was quite difficult for Kelly. And you can see there just a lot of uncoordinated movements, had difficulty trying to figure out how to get that motor pattern back. So that was a lot of our, our focus there when trying to do these type of exercise. And what was cool about doing this kind of exercise is you saw a big difference when we put on the vest. So we put on the vest, and she did the same things, the same day, same time, or just right afterwards. And she just tolerates that movement so well. She can move her head freely, her body rotates, doesn't have any of those awkward coordinating movements. This is my favorite part, she did, a, she did an amazing little spin there. And again, is so excited. It was always such a joy to have in the clinic. She was always smiling. So that was one month later. Now we have two months later, we, have her working on some balance now on the beam, but in this video we added a cognitive task. So I had her reading out numbers out loud as someone held up uh, in front of her. So just again, just similar to how we treat a concussion when you add that kind of task, just overloads the brain just a little bit more. And you can see she's struggling that with that a little bit. I'm having to spot her as she goes in behind. But same kind of idea, we add the vest, and just night and day with what you can do. I'm, I'm, I'm not even touching her in that, in that position. So that was really neat to see again, such a, such a nice progression of her balance. But at this point too, we, she was fitted with her own vest and that, that's what she's wearing in this video. We had an OT from Ontario um, custom make a vest for her, which was really helpful. So this was five months later. Um, again, her balance had just improved so much by this point. She's walking backwards on the beam with no support, nothing needed, no vest, can just tolerate that so much better and no kind of awkward, uncoordinated movements happening. And then we even got her doing it eyes closed. So again, just that much more of a challenge. She's able to do this now, no problem. Eyes closed is still a bit of a challenge, but such a big improvement to where, so where she came from. So kind of like I was saying earlier, no one really knows what's going on with Japanese encephalitis when it comes to treatment. They have no intervention strategies available for physios um, and any kind of research. So with this, this was a bit of trial and error for me um, as well, trying to figure out what to do with Kelly. And, and again, it's going to be very patient oriented and very patient dependent. What was really great for her is we saw a lot of good results with the way we treated it. So again, just treating it more like a brain injury than all than anything else. Um, very much the weighted vest made a big difference with Kelly. 
the big focus on planning and pacing and just having a bit more structure in her day allowed her to be able to tolerate more because again she was being told by multiple doctors that this is we don't know what to do with you like no one's seen this before we don't know what you can tolerate you don't know what your future looks like a lot of kind of unknowns where it just get giving kelly a bit more of that structure to push herself was really helpful again the vision and the vestibular exercise is really important for her too treating it like a brain injury where there is all those systems involved and attacking kind of each one a little bit individually, but then also bringing them all together was a vital piece of her treatment, along with just patient centered activities. I mean, we do that for, we do that, we should be doing that for our patients anyway, just having it more directed to what they love or what they like doing. And for Kelly, that was, she loved to play piano. So her vision exercises were involving reading one note, reading the other notes so or working on a cicade or working on a tracking ability with the piano. And then she liked to run. So that was a big piece for her, just getting her back into running, getting her back to be able to do something she loves. And I think now she's at the point where she can run a 5K faster than I can, uh, which is quite, quite amazing. And so the big, the other big thing for Kelly too, was just that mindfulness piece and being super aware of what her body was telling her and listening to her body and, and kind of approaching it without judgment. I think we don't have a lot of research on what to do for management wise. So it was a lot of trial and error. So being really gentle with any time that we did kind of push it and it didn't go well, just knowing that we, it didn't necessarily mean that we had a big setback. And the thing that was so great about Kelly made her such a joy to treat is she came in every single day to the clinic, super grateful. And that gratitude piece was always valuable for her and always something that she was displaying. And I think that was so big in the sense that she didn't ever come in and be like, oh, poor me, I have this, I have this diagnosis that no one knows what to do with. Instead, she just took it as a, a amazing opportunity. And she, she loved life just so much more. And every, it was always so eager to learn, always so eager to try and just push her boundaries and in different ways. So that was always inspiring to see. And so I just have her kind of explain a little bit more about what worked for her. So I'll just show you a quick, I'll end that video that we started earlier today. What was beneficial in my recovery following the acute phase was my neurophysio rehab and to have a very specific plan of action that targeted the small intricate steps that would lead to my success with the greater gross movement goals. A weighted vest was essential to reestablishing the connection with my vestibular system, plus eyes closed exercises. Two, my specific eye exercises for tracking and developing my brain's ability to sense its peripheral boundaries. This enabled me to control my eye movements and hopefully in the future be able to drive again. Short and long-term memory recalls through video displays were amazingly uplifting to a brain that was full of fog. The use of optokinetic videos so my brain can navigate surrounding movements were so beneficial. Sound videos with initial noise blockers, decreasing in time, allowing my brain to relearn how to filter surrounding volumes. All noises were extremely loud to me in the beginning. Keeping a point journal of activity so as not to enter the danger zone that would result in a reoccurrence of negative symptoms was super beneficial also. Lots of encouragement, positive reinforcement, and goal setting brought me incredible joy and kept my spirits uplifted. Today I'm running intervals of 3.4 kilometers as well as riding a bike short distances. I've gained so much of my life back. I'm so excited to see what larger goals can be achieved through developing my intricate skill sets. I hope this will be a beneficial and helpful platform to all those who may encounter people recovering from the debilitating effects of encephalitis. Thank you so much to my therapist for my recovery. So I promise I didn't pay her to say any of that, uh, but sometimes it's just nice to get a little bit more of the patient perspective. So again, that's kind of the summary of it. Like I said, we don't have a ton of research and we don't have a ton of references to go off of. So I hope maybe you can take one or two things out of here that might be helpful for you if you do ever see this diagnosis in your clinical career. 
especially big thank you to Kelly for letting me share her story and for again always bringing a little bit of or bringing some light to my my day and always being so open and, and to try new things in the, in the clinic if you have any questions please feel free to contact me at um, my email below i'd love to hear from you with any concerns or questions that you might have in regards to this case and again thank you for taking the time to listen hope to hear from you soon